Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. And welcome, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. I'm Gary Machuda, and you have entered into the Virgin Most Powerful Apologetic Dojo. And uh, we are going to talk about sharing, defending the faith today. And uh, looks like we got a test pattern on YouTube. <laughs> I shouldn't even interrupt that. But uh, just FYI, uh, if you're watching YouTube, this is going to look like a great show, if that's all you see is the test pattern. <laughs> Anyway, uh, welcome. You know, we're going to have a different program today, as you can already tell. Uh, no guests. We're just going to go into the dojo mailbox and uh, go through some of the emails. that We've been getting some fantastic emails uh, over the past couple of weeks, actually, you know, since the beginning of the show, but especially last couple of weeks. And uh, so we went through some of them last week. I'm going to try to go through some more today and specifically... Uh, God willing, if we have the time, I'd love to address one email, which involves uh, the conservative uh, Jewish commentator Ben Shapiro, who uh, had made an offhanded comment that he, uh, of course, he's not Christian, he's Jewish, but he said that, uh, that he believed the Gospels uh, deserve to be in the fiction section of a bookstore. And uh, so we're not we're not going to dive too much into him as, you know, uh, exactly what he says because i really don't know his position never really heard him explain uh why exactly uh he uh has difficulties with christianity but i figured we could answer it in general because that's actually a really good question is uh how would you explain to a non-believer uh specifically perhaps a jewish believer who uh rejects the gospels as fiction how would you approach them i'm going to try an approach where we're going to cite practically no scripture and I think we could answer some of the uh, uh, at least more obvious objections. So we'll dig into that uh, later on in the program, but we're also going to go through some uh, emails. So it's going to be a lot of fun, folks. Uh, like I said, not a typical program, but uh, why not change things up? You know, let's have a little fun. And talking about changing things up, I, I want to give a shout out to all those watching live stream on youtube and facebook hello everybody welcome yes thank you for the sensei emoji explosion love it you know we should have some background music richard like some sort of a emoji explosion there's got to be a song out there somewhere about that <laughs> hello folks and welcome all you listening live on radio and also listening on podcast it's great to be with you um <laughs> as always uh you know it's it's a pleasure to talk about the things that uh we need to know and learn to better share and explain our faith and part of that is building up our critical thinking skills so as every program we look at some sort of uh, logical fallacy with our finding of the fallacy segment but since it's friday I usually switch things up a little bit and go to a propaganda technique. So today we're going to talk about the propaganda technique of grabbing the rhetorical middle. Grabbing the rhetorical middle. And we also meet one of the early church fathers and just get a, a short bio of him. And today's early church father is an important one and one uh, that's used a lot in Catholic apologetics. And that is Cyril of Jerusalem, St. Cyril of Jerusalem. So, uh, got lots in store for you today. The mailbox, we got the Finding the Fallacy, Meet the Early Church Fathers, and we have you. If you'd like to join the program, maybe you have a, a question or comment, I'll be glad to answer any question that I know the answer to. So, give us a call at 888-526-2151. That is 888-526-2151. And, uh, as always, love to hear from you. Um, also... Uh, keep the emails coming, folks. Great input um, to email us. Just shoot your email to questions at handsonapologetics.com. That's all one word, questions at handsonapologetics.com. 
that email flies through the mysterious internet straight into the dojo mailbox and i do answer them i do reply the people can attest to that um and sometimes sometimes we'll even read them on the air so oh, by the way i should note that if you have something that is personally don't want to be shared on the air please put that in the comment section or something in the email just say you know i i don't want this to be aired i'll be glad to keep it private because after all that's we're here to be your lifelines you know, try to help uh, provide you with the resources to better explain and defend the faith with clarity and charity. So let's see, why don't we jump to our Finding the Fallacy segment. And like I said, it's propaganda. And the propaganda technique is the grabbing the rhetorical middle. Grabbing the rhetorical middle. What is what is the rhetorical middle? Well, rhetoric is just a way of saying things. I guess that's a way you can put it. Um so there's a lot of rhetoric today. Uh, there is you can uh, give formal speeches. That's a form of rhetoric. You can uh, tell stories, things like that. And uh, the way you shape your uh, how you share information uh, will impact the effect it has on the audience, right? So grabbing the rhetorical middle. I, I think if there is a modern slang, although this is a bit dated, if you ever heard of triangulation. Remember back in the Clinton era, uh, there was a popular name of triangulation. That's basically grabbing the rhetorical middle. Okay, so what is it? Well, folks, people don't like to be painted as extremists. No one likes to be on the fringe. No one likes to be on you know, the extreme left or the extreme right or extremely conservative or extremely liberal. There's something about human nature that we like to be in the middle. We like to be mainstreaming it because... There's comfort in mainstreaming it. You know, you feel like you're not alone. You're not some kook on the fringe, but rather you're just part of uh, normal humanity. And so uh, this propaganda technique tries to exploit that. And how it does it is it will take its opponents, whatever opponent it is, whether in politics or religion or uh, in manufacturing, advertising, whatever, and it'll try to paint the opposition as extremist okay so so and so has this extreme position so and so has this extreme position and by painting your opposition as extreme positions what happens is by default your position looks to be in the comfortable middle and so people naturally gravitate to follow you because after all no one wants to be an extremist that we all want to be part of that comfortable middle, right? And so, uh, therefore, your position looks much more attractive than your opposition. Now, of course, you know, that falls apart if you think about it critically, because uh, there's nothing wrong with being extremely correct, and there's everything to be wrong with being extremely incorrect, right? <laughs> so it, it, painting to extremes doesn't necessarily mean that uh, your position is correct. Um, so that's grabbing the rhetorical mill. Just be aware of that. Whenever somebody paints opposition as two, perhaps two uh, extreme positions, uh, and then they try to make themselves appear to be the middle streaming it, middle of the road type uh, position, uh, your antenna should go up because it's chances are they're using the grabbing rhetorical middle uh, propaganda technique. All right, cool. Now let's move on to our Meet the Early Church Father. And today's Early Church Father is Cyril of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was born roughly around 315 A.D., died around 386. Uh, we don't know exactly where he was born, probably Jerusalem. Uh, and exactly when he was born is a mere, it's just conjectures. He was made Bishop of Jerusalem in 348 A.D. And he was consecrated uh by the proper bishop, which is Acacius, who is the Metropolitan of Caesarea. Now, unfortunately, Acacius was an Arian. Arian, if you remember, was one of those ancient heresies where uh, they believed that Jesus wasn't consubstantial with the Father, wasn't equal to the Father, but was kind of like a lesser uh, deity, I suppose. Um, so the problem is, since he was consecrated by this Arian bishop, uh, there was uh, many suspicions about whether or not Cyril of Jerusalem was Orthodox. And uh, and perhaps he may have even made uh, doctrinal concessions in order to be uh, 
made a bishop. Well, all that kind of cleared up when he immediately came into conflict, not only with the bishop Acacius, uh, the metropolitan Acacius, but also other Arians, because he defended the Nicene doctrine that the son is consubstantial with the father. So basically he shows that uh, he's orthodox on that point. Now, uh, although Cyril generally preferred the term like substance to same substance or consubstantial, which in Greek is homoousius as opposed to homoousius. Um, one means like, the other one means same. Uh, but the problem is, is that uh, although he kind of sided with the more heretical term, he understood that term in an orthodox sense. So, uh, and this, of course, led him to become out of favor with the Arians. Uh, so his episcopate was a stormy one. Um, he was expelled three times from his see, uh, though he did enjoy a period of peace in his declining years beginning uh, around the death of the Emperor Velens in about 378. And uh, he lived you know, peacefully, more or less, in Jerusalem until 386 AD. And by the way, you should also be aware that uh, although fragments of his works are preserved in throughout history, there is one main body of work that apologists almost always go to when they're talking about the, the doctrines of the early church, and that's his catechetical lectures. Uh, this is a collection of 24 lectures, the first being an introductory discourse, and the rest being numbered from 1 to 23. The first 18 are pre-baptismal dis uh, discourses that he gave, and the last five were delivered to neophytes during Easter week. Excuse me, Easter week. Uh, so very important, very important early church father, very important document. That Cyril of Jerusalem. Coming up on the other side of the break, we're going to dive into the dojo mailbox. So stay tuned, everybody. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. 
Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. Hands-on apologetics. Well, it's time for us to jump into the mailbox, uh, ladies and gentlemen. But actually, before I do that, let me give you a, a little bit of a tease for what's coming up next week. We're going to have we're going to have an incredible week of guests uh, coming. Actually, next Monday on the twentieth, we have the incomparable Steve Ray coming into the dojo, um, followed by Father Robert Spitzer on Tuesday. On Wednesday, Carlo Brassard. And on Thursday, the 23rd, Dr. Douglas Beaumont returns back to the dojo. Uh, so it's going to be a fantastic week. I thought, man, what a way to, to blow the doors off right before uh, the weekend, huh? So uh, something to look forward to over the weekend uh, if you're into apologetics. Uh, I am t- I'm, I'm going to be on pins and needles until next Monday. Uh, let's jump to the Dojo Mailbox. Uh, the first question we got from Gina. Now, Gina, thank you for your patience if you happen to be listening. I was going to include your email last week when I went to the mailbox, but uh, time ran out on us, and I didn't want to give you um, a short shrift, so I decided to hold on. Okay, so Gina writes, uh, I'm discussing early church worship with my husband's Seventh-day Adventist elder. I'm Catholic, and I told him that lying to people about early church worship was wrong. Uh, They tell their congregation that early Christians all worshiped on the Sabbath, meaning Saturday. And I found on uh, Teresa Beebe's blog that the Jews did not worship in the synagogue because they could only worship in the temple. Is that true? I have tracts from Catholic Answers, uh, but they don't speak of this. Thank you. Love your books on the Catholic Bible and Hostile Witnesses. Well, thank you, Gina. I appreciate it. Yeah, that's uh, you know, great, great email. Um, uh, Teresa Beam, I think, is really the go-to source in the Catholic sphere uh, for Catholics who are dealing with Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, she herself is a former Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, her stories on the Journey Home program. And she also wrote a book uh it's called it's okay not to be a seventh day adventist now her name is teresa beam b-e-e-m so that's a, a resource i think everybody should uh have on your folder somewhere so just in case you do run across uh, someone from the sda um or someone's thinking about joining the sda you need to be able to know what it's all about and how to explain it uh i haven't been to her blog so um I'm sure it's good stuff, but uh, I just haven't followed her recently. Uh, but anyway, what about this question? The Jews didn't worship in the, in the synagogue because they only worshiped at the temple. And, you know, that's a really interesting point. Uh, I guess it, you know, but I think the strength of that argument depends on how people define worship. Okay. If you are going to define what is worship in the first century before the destruction of the temple in AD 70 for a Jew... Uh, worship would be offering temple sacrifices. They were offered not only on the Sabbath, but the, the temple was offering sacrifices every day of the week. You know, uh, so uh, you know that would count as quote unquote worship. Of course, prayer does too. It wasn't an either or. It was really a both and. In fact, you know, prayer and sacrifice go together. So uh, I think yeah, if you if you're talking to a first century Jew and started talking about worship, they probably wouldn't immediately think about the prayer in the synagogue as much as offering sacrifices. Now, of course, when the, the temple's destroyed in 70 AD, sacrifices ceased, and uh, so, in a sense, uh, worship was kind of, tra- in a more general sense, was transformed to the synagogue, where you have the readings and teachings and prayer. Now, that's where it becomes, uh, you know, a little bit more of a difficult uh, argument. It kind of loses its steam because that's how Protestants consider worship. They would consider prayer as the highest form of worship. Why? Because they don't have the sacrifice of the Mass. So, you know, if you're going to use this for uh, an SDA, who is Protestant, right? Seventh-day Adventists are Protestants. I don't know how much traction you get, to tell you the truth. Um but I think, on the whole, I think Teresa Beam's correct, and uh, it's an interesting point. Whether or not it will have a great effect, I'm not sure. But Gina, if you're listening, hey, try it out. Let us know how it worked, because <laughs> uh, 
um, you know, it, I, it's an important point, and I, I think it's uh, I think it's got some truth behind it. So, but again, I'm not sure how much of effect it has. And by the way, you know, people ask, well, why is it that we worship on Sunday instead of Saturday? In fact, th this was brought up on some of the uh, blogs here in the Archdiocese of Detroit. They are no longer going to allow uh, CYO, Catholic Youth Organization, sporting events being scheduled on Sunday because they it's encroaching upon giving the honor to God. You know, parents are going to sporting events and skipping Mass, which is horrible. So anyway, uh, we actually had some people, you know, there's a lot of angry Catholic parents out there that apparently would rather have the sports, you know, on the Lord's Day. And, and uh, so they say, well, the Sabbath, that's Saturday. That's not Sunday. So, you know, what's all this about? Well, folks, if you want to explain why we worship on Sunday, this is the text to go to. Um, it is uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 through 15, because it explains why God commanded the Sabbath, why we honored the Lord's Day. Two reasons, folks. Number one, because God rested on the seventh day in creation. Okay, so it harkens reminding of God's sovereignty and creation. And number two, to remember that you were once slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you with a strong hand and outstretched arm. And that's why the Lord your God commanded you to observe the Sabbath, is to remind us of the Exodus. Okay, now, what happens in the New Covenant is Christ comes as a new Adam, and he forms a new creation in the resurrection and ushers in a new humanity. Okay, so if the old covenant would remember God's creation of the cosmos in the beginning, we remember the new creation on the day of resurrection, which is Sunday, the eighth day. Uh, also, well, what about the Exodus? Well, Christ comes as a new Moses. And in fact, if you look at Luke 9.31, uh, during the transfiguration, you find out that Jesus is speaking with Moses and Elijah uh, about the exodus in which he's going to accomplish in Jerusalem. In other words, Jesus is the new Moses who institutes the new Passover, the Mass, and he takes us on a new exodus towards the true promised land in heaven. So, Sunday also reminds us of this new exodus. So um, on both accounts, you know, Sunday for Christians is the Lord's Day. All right, very good. Awesome question. Thank you so much, Gina, for uh, emailing us. Next one's from John. John says, thank you for the, uh, the wonderful podcast. Oh, it's a podcast listener. No problem, John. I've been learning so much, and I'm so happy I can hear you on podcast after uh, discovering you last year. Well, thanks. Welcome aboard. Welcome to the dojo. Uh, I feel very strongly that I should join the Catholic faith, coming from an evangelical background. Can you tell me why God doesn't direct us all to correct doctrine rather than having a squabble about uh, amongst ourselves? Things like the role of faith and works, the priesthood on earth, the proper standard of authority in Christian life, uh, whether remaining Protestant or Orthodox or joining the Catholic Church is sufficient. I have a lot of evangelical friends who love God and uh, testify to God working in their lives and answering prayers. So if God can interact with our lives in that way, why doesn't he directly, uh, or why doesn't he direct them more aggressively to the Catholic Church? Uh, do you know kind of what I mean? Uh, sometimes I feel like none of these doctoral things matter to God. Thank you, John. Well, hey, thanks for joining the program. Thanks for listening. And uh, I just want to share, you know, the to me, the answer is really found in history. I think history really is the bottom line. If someone became a Christian in the first few centuries of the church, doctrine truly wouldn't be too huge of an issue because uh, you would sit at the feet of the disciples or the disciples of the disciples of Christ, right? Uh, if you come to the conviction that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God, then there's really only one church they could join except for some small heretical groups um, that were kind of wacky and obviously wrong. So that wouldn't be a problem for the first few centuries. And then, you know, even when there was Trinitarian or Christological errors, you know, nevertheless, the See of Rome remained Orthodox while the rest of the church faltered. Um, 
And then you come to the great East-West schism with the Orthodox, and we both claim apostolic origins. We're do both doctrinally very similar. However, if you look into history, you'll find out, and this is admitted even by Orthodox uh, patrologists, uh, that the Orthodox fathers recognized the primacy of Rome prior to the schism. Uh, so they kind of broke uh, with their past in kind of separating from uh, the West. And also I would say they, you can also see that they, they've changed on other matters, such as uh, they're, they're kind of waffly in regards to divorce and remarriage, artificial contraception, uh, and also they tend to break into factions themselves. And actually, we probably shouldn't talk about the Orthodox Church as much as the Orthodox Churches because it's fill, it's it's a, uh, a composite of autocephalous churches. Auto, um, mainly, the, each church has its own rule or uh, uh, way of rule. So it, it's really churches more than church. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, you the doctrine stuff, I think, still would matter. You'd still know which is the true church. But, you know, the problem really came at the Protestant Reformation. Uh, when Protestant reformers broke away from the church, they immediately began to, to splinter with each person going off with uh, how they read Scripture and how they believed the gospel was supposed to be interpreted. And uh, with the rejection of the historic church as a visible, identifiable, historical entity, the church kind of became invisible. It's just a collection of like-minded believers. So uh, that didn't necessarily belong to in one physical place or have the same worship or same government. Uh, and with all these schisms and new denominations, that's where this doctrinal mess that we now live in, John, is basically from you know, all these schisms from the, the uh, Protestant churches. And if you remember in John eighteen twenty one, Jesus prayed. He says, I pray that they may all be one, Father. May they be in us just as you are in me and I am in you. May they be one so that the world will believe that you sent me. In other words, the unity of the church, the oneness of the church, that we're all united to Christ and from Christ to God, right? I mean, it's it's all within the Trinity. Uh, that the world will look and believe that the Father sent the Son. And, uh, you know, with the proliferation of all these Protestant sects, uh, it has led many Protestants, many Christians, to kind of just give up on doctrinal matters and see Christianity as an idea rather than a historic faith. And I think it's also led the church, or not the church, but the world, to look at Christianity and cease believing in Jesus. So just something to think about. On the other side of the break, we're going to talk about is the New Testament fiction. Stay tuned, folks. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. 
please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. Um, we're going through the Dojo mailbox, and uh, one email we received was an email concerning a uh, conservative uh, talk show host, uh, Ben Shapiro, who is a uh, pro-life, conservative, uh, Jewish, and uh, he's not afraid to talk about religion. And uh, during one of his remarks, he mentioned that he thought that in regards to the Gospels, that it essentially is fiction. And uh, so uh, uh, for the the person who emailed, I'm not going to get into details because, frankly, I don't know a lot about him. I don't know if he's ever explained exactly why he believes that. But I thought that uh, you bringing it up was a, a good idea because it'd be kind of fun to see how could we answer someone, uh, anybody, just a, a non-Christian who uh, says, oh, well, the Gospels are fiction. Uh, is, do we have any solid reasons to to suggest to them that no, there's something going on here that uh, is very real in the early church. And so that's what I want to do. I want to take the rest of the program. Let's try to unpack this because it's a cool uh, conundrum, I guess you could say. Okay. Well, first, yeah, what does you always ask questions? What do you mean by fiction? Because there's lots of different kinds of fiction, folks. There's historical fiction, there's uh, pure fiction. There is uh, all sorts of things. And uh, so if he's saying, uh, I-, I believe it should be in the fiction because it's just pure fiction, totally made up. There wasn't a historical Jesus. Uh, this is just the concoctions of uh, crazy Gentiles hundreds of years later. Um, you know, how would you respond? Well, uh, I would say, look, look at the sources. Let's just, since you don't believe the the Gospels, the New Testament is historical, uh, we'll just set those aside and maybe just with a, a general understanding of their teachings, but we'll set them aside. Uh, was Jesus a historical person? Could you still demonstrate that? And I believe you can. I, I, I think that uh, that's really, uh, I think you have to be really on the fringe to deny this. Uh, uh, for example, uh, in Jewish writings, in rabbinical writings, uh, they're very clear about Jesus of Nazareth in the sense that they treat him as a real historic person, okay? So uh, if you're Jewish and uh, you have uh, some belief in the Talmud and and, uh, other writings, then uh, you would have to say, well, yeah, it's historical because our, our ancestors treated him as historical. And think about it this way. If you wanted to wipe out a heresy that was based on a fictitious character, what better way to do it than to say he never existed? <laughs> but they didn't. Instead, they said that uh, Yeshua was uh, uh, a deceiver, that he was executed during the Passover, uh, that uh, they actually have a counter story to the virgin birth, that he's the product of an illicit union with a uh, pagan soldier. All of this presupposes that we're dealing with a real historic entity. So I don't think you could really say that it would be pure history. And on top of that, too, you also have extra-biblical writings by pagans that also attest to Jesus as a real historic person. For example, Tacitus, uh, the great Roman historian Tacitus mentions him, uh, I think it's in his annals, if I remember correctly, uh, where uh, he basically points out exactly when Jesus was. Um, He uh, talks about his execution. And he talks about how uh, his believers, you know, his followers, spread from Judea out throughout the whole world, even to Rome. Again, you know, they didn't. There's no suggestion there of any kind of fiction going on. 
In fact, uh, now some people, you always have skeptics who are on the verge of incredulity. Like they, they virtually won't accept anything that they don't want to believe in. Uh, but uh, for those who study the writings of Tacitus, also Suetunus, and, and others who mention Jesus uh, from pagan sources, uh, you know, especially Tacitus, it's pretty solid, right? That, uh, yeah, this, this isn't a genuine writing from this Roman historian who mentions Jesus. And on top of that, you have Jewish writings. And, uh, you know, it, it was never a case in the ancient world that Jesus was treated as a fictional character. They all believed he was real. And uh, where they disputed was where he was a messiah or a deceiver or, uh, you know, was he a, a Jewish rebel? So uh, so I think you could cross off your list uh, that it's uh, pure fiction, okay? Now, maybe he believes the Gospels are fiction because uh, he doesn't believe that the Messiah came. And, of course, the the main thrust of the Gospels is that Yeshua of Nazareth is the Messiah, right? Well, so, you know, I think what you have to do is ask yourself, well, is it plausible that he could be the Messiah? And, folks, this is where, you know, we go a little bit into some Old Testament. So I said I'm going to set aside the Gospels, right? And we're going to focus on the New Testament, okay? Uh, Or, excuse me, the Old Testament. In Daniel chapter 6, he gives this very famous uh, prophecy about 70 weeks are decreed for your people and for the holy city. Then transgression will stop, sin will end, guilt will be expiated, everlasting justice will be introduced, vision and prophecy ratified, and the most holy will be anointed. Uh, So 70 weeks of years has been prophesied. Calculations of that generally end up in the first century. Uh, according to Gleason Archer, for example, uh, if you uh, take the dates that he gives, you end up roughly around AD 27, right around the time of the crucifixion. And, and even the most common views of Jewish interpreters of this passage uh, also place it in the uh, first century context. In fact, some of them think that it's prophesying about the death of King Agrippa in AD 44. Now, of course, King Agrippa, uh, I, there's no reason to believe that his death uh, brought about any of the things mentioned in Daniel. But nevertheless, it does uh, give evidence that, according to the dating, we end up in the first century. Um, another thing, too, is in Daniel 6.26, when he's talking about these, these weeks, he goes, after 62 weeks, an anointed which shall be cut down when he does not possess the city, and the people of the leader who will come will destroy the sanctuary. Then the end shall come like a torrent until the end there shall be war, desolation that is decreed. Now this is a really important verse. And, you know, I would say, uh, think about that. That it says that the anointed one, the Messiah, will be cut down or cut off. Okay. This seems to suggest death. Okay, in fact, uh, in rabbinical interpretations, you know, it's often talked about as uh, the Messiah, Messiah Ben Joseph dies. Okay, and then what happens? The sanctuary is destroyed. Well, what's the sanctuary? That's the second temple. When was it destroyed? Everybody, A.D. 70. Okay, so we know from Daniel 6.26 that the Messiah must come before the second temple is destroyed according to this prophecy, and it was destroyed in AD 70. Okay, put the two together, what do you get? You get that the Messiah, whoever he is, had to have come by AD 70. Okay, and that's why in the New Testament, when you read the Gospels, and not just the New Testament, read Josephus, who records the history in the first century, uh, or any other, uh, even pagan writers, you find out that in Judea, there was this heightened expectation that a a leader will arise and he'll have universal dominion, okay? He will come from Judah, have universal dominion. And by the way, that harkens again back to the Son of Man prophecies in Daniel. Now, this isn't just my opinion. Like I said, Josephus chronicles 
uh, numerous p leaders who rose in the first century who more or less claimed to be the Messiah that many people followed, then they were killed and their followers dispersed. In fact, he believed that the revolt that ultimately ended with the destruction of the temple was due to, well, let me read Josephus for you. This is from the Jewish War 654. Okay, easy way to remember, 654. He says, an ambiguous oracle that was also found in their sacred writings, that's Jewish sacred writings, and how about the time one from their country would become governor of the inhabitable earth. The Jews took this prediction to belong to themselves in particular, and many of the wise men were thereby deceived in their determination. In other words, he's saying that the first revolt against Rome in the first century was due to a prophecy about a leader coming and, and being the governor of the inhabitable earth. This is definitely a, a reference to Daniel. So Josephus says th the Jews of that time were waiting for the Messiah. They believed that he was coming then. And, by the way, you also have Roman historians, which is kind of interesting. Um, like Tacitus, once again, you know, one of the, the best Roman historians out there. Uh, he says that... Uh, Actually, it's in his histories, book five, uh, paragraph 13. He says this, quote, Some few, a, fear, a fearful meaning on these events, but in most there was a firm persuasion, now he's talking about the revolt, that in the ancient records of their priest was contained a prediction of how at this very time in the East uh, was to grow powerful and rulers coming out of Judea were to acquire universal empire. So even the pagan historian Tacitus was aware of this uh, prophetic expectation among the Jews in the first century that the Jewish Messiah will come and he'll be a universal ruler, right? And, um, and the same thing with Josephus as well. So we also saw in Daniel that the Messiah has to be cut down or cut off prior to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So the question is, if you're a non-believing Jew, right, um, and you think the Gospels are fiction, well, I, I think it's difficult for you to say, well, it's fiction because uh, he couldn't possibly be the Messiah because, again, Daniel and all these historic evidence shows that, yes, there was a very real expectation in the first century, including a prophecy that the Messiah is going to come, and he most definitely would be co coming before the destruction of the temple. Now, if Jesus isn't the Messiah, then who was? Right? Well, that's a that's a great cliffhanger to come on the other side of the break. Listen to Hands On Apologetics, folks. And we're kind of digging into, well, could the Gospels be fiction? They're giving some good reasons why there's good reason to not even consider the problem. More on the other side of the break. Stay tuned. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support 
because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. Uh, well, we're kind of diving into the Dojo mailbox, and one question was uh, actually uh, concerning a conservative Jewish commentator who just made an offhanded comment that uh, the, he believed the Gospels were fiction. And uh, so I thought, boy, that would be really interesting to have a discussion on this and kind of give this person reasons why you should probably suspect that there's more going on here than meets the eye. So on the, before the break, we talked about, well, could it be that he thought it's fiction because Jesus isn't a historical person? It was kind of a fictitious person. We showed how uh, that can't be true. Uh, we said, well, perhaps he believes it's fiction because he didn't believe that the, uh, the first century framework fit for the arrival of the Messiah. And we showed both from Jewish and also pagan documents that there definitely was uh, understanding of Daniel to believe that, yeah, the, the Messiah would show up and in fact did show up prior to the destruction of the temple in AD 70. So what are other ways he could dismiss it as fiction? Maybe miracles. Maybe miracles. Well, maybe uh, it's fiction because the, the Gospels contain Jesus performing miracles, casting out demons, uh, especially the miracle of the resurrection. Um, and uh, I don't know. Like I said, I, I don't know this particular host very well. don't really follow his work that much, so I can't really comment on particulars. I don't know what his beliefs are as far as miracles and stuff. But nevertheless, uh, I think there is excellent evidence outside the Gospels themselves that Jesus and his followers did indeed perform miracles. Um, uh, for example, uh, the first century Jewish historian Josephus, he wrote roughly about A.D. 100, uh, wrote in his book Antiquities, which is a huge uh, history of the Jews. Uh, he has a section about Jesus. And uh, this section has been debated a bit. Uh, some people believe that the entire section is authentic part of Josephus's work. Uh, some uh, uh, minority as well believe that it's, it's entirely a Christian interpolation that was foisted into the text. But I think a majority of scholars would say that it's primarily genuine with maybe one or two small interpolations placed in it. And uh, in this section, this is in his work, Antiquities, Book 18, Chapter 3, Paragraph 3, where he mentions Jesus. He says this. Now, remember, this is not a Christian writer. This is a Jewish writer. He says, now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works. Okay. Now, uh you know, uh, let's just take that. We're not going to look at, uh, that could be an entire program or several programs in itself going through the, the whole of Josephus' testimony. But, okay, first, a Christian wouldn't call Jesus a wise man. Okay, that seems like a particularly non-Christian way of uh, speaking about him. Uh, and if this is a Christian interpolation, that they probably would excise that particular remark. And uh, But the part where he says he was a doer of wonderful works, that attests to Jesus performing miracles. Now, someone may say, okay, well, that's a Christian interpolation. See, they're just kind of putting into this text of this Jewish historians as Christian ideas. But, folks, you know what's interesting is elsewhere in Antiquities, uh, Josephus talks about the prophet Elijah. 
And when he's describing the prophet Elijah, guess what? He describes him as a doer, for, a doer of wonderful deeds. Essentially the same thing he says about Jesus. So this is definitely very Josephan kind of language. Okay. So, okay, so we have this testimony. But not only that, but we also have Talmudic testimony as well. It's in Hadron 43a. It has this text about Jesus. Now listen close. I'm just going to quote the first line. It says, on the eve of Passover, Yashu was hanged because he practiced sorcery. Okay. Yashu is talking about Jesus, Yeshua. Okay. Now, think about this. It says that he, why was he executed uh, uh, on, uh, on the eve of Passover? For practicing sorcery. What? What does it mean, practicing sorcery? Well, could that be? that he's practicing miracles? I mean, for a non-believer to look at miracles, you know, how would you describe it? If it doesn't come from God, then it, it has to be, come from some other forces, like sorcery, magic, or demons. Remember uh, when Jesus was casting out demons? The Pharisees in Scripture, now I'm, I'm quoting the Gospel, so you'll have to forgive me for this, but remember what they say. He cast out demons by the power of the prince of demons, Beelzebub. Right? So this fits right in line with what we see in the Gospels. And notice what it's talking about. It's talking about miracles, about supernatural exercise of power. Um, you know, there's also, there's great evidence, not only uh, there, but also in the, 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 uh, the Talmud of Christians healing in the name of Jesus, where Christians would whisper the name of Jesus over a wound or an affliction, and Jews were being healed. In fact, there were measures taken to uh, stop Jews from allowing Christians to heal them in the name of Jesus. That should also sound familiar to the Christians reading the book of Acts, right? Uh, the Acts of the Apostles. Um, uh, so these are real things happening that uh, they're reacting against, that uh, apparently the name of Jesus heals. Now, if the name of Jesus heals, isn't it even more probable that Jesus himself could heal? <laughs> you know, another thing, too, I, I'm just going to throw this on the heat, folks, is uh, Tacitus, once again, that Roman historian, wrote just after the turn of the first Christian century. Uh, he mentions that the Christians were accused of the crime of hatred against humanity. And in my book, uh, uh, in my book, I point out that this crime of hatred against humanity is uh, was Describing the crimes of poisoning, and guess what? Magic. Okay? So if you're uh, guilty of poisoning someone, you're guilty of the crime of hatred against humanity, or if you practice magic. Now, I think we can safely say that Christians, by and large, would not be considered poisoners, right? So why is it that the, these pagans accuse them of practicing magic? Well, put two and two together. They were healing. They were performing miracles, right? And the pagans, they were, you know, not knowing exactly where it's coming from, says, hey, guess what? Uh, these people are practicing this weird form of magic. Okay. So, uh, again, for this Jewish commentator who uh, dismisses the Gospels, uh, if, if he's dismissing it because if Jesus performs miracles, I think... Uh, uh, he's not in good grounds because we have extra biblical sources that suggest otherwise, that this is indeed very plausible and the gospels kind of fit with the evidence. Now, of course, the resurrection, that deserves an apology all of itself or defense, not an apology, but a defense in the, the older form of apology. Uh, we're not going to get into that, but there are some very good books defending uh, the resurrection just on common sensical grounds, right? All right, well, then what could be the claim? What, what could be the problem here? Why would the Gospels be seen as fiction for this person? Well, perhaps it's the fact that Jesus claimed to be God. And I think that this probably is where, if it isn't the main point or main reason he dismisses it as fiction, it's got to be up there in the top three. Because for the Jews, there's one God and only one God, the Lord. Okay, and uh, and no one else, 
right? So for a, a man to claim to be God would be ridiculous, right? Because a man cannot be God, right? And I love Rosalind Moss, or she who is formerly known as Rosalind Moss. I love her comeback to this. She says, it's true. It's impossible for a man to become God, but it's not impossible for God to become man. Ah, there you go. Uh, but nevertheless, it, you know, given what we know about the, the background in the first century, is it possible that the door could have been opened for the Messiah being, in some sense, divine? And the answer is, yeah, there's actually a lot in the Old Testament we can appeal to, like in Isaiah 9.5, for example. Now, this is, you know, the famous one, the, the son, a son is given to us, you know, a son is born to us. Uh, the government will rest on his shoulder, and he shall be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Uh, and so the son shall be called, that's given to us, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, wonder, wonderful counselor. Uh, these are divine titles. And that's kind of interesting. Uh, there's a, uh, a commentary uh, written by Samuel David uh, Luzetto. He's an Italian Jewish scholar, one of the greatest scholars, Italian rabbis. And he writes that, Interesting enough, he points out that you do not, now this is a quote, you do not expect to find attributes of God here, uh, but such as would be characteristic of a child. Oh, that's weird. The child's given divine, divine uh, you know, titles, as it will. And then you have Psalm 110, verse 1, where it says, uh, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Okay. And Jesus uses this. In fact, this is one of the uh, most quoted passages of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And what's significant here is that if the son of David is merely a human, just the son of David, nothing more, and namely the Messiah is the son of David, then why would David call him my Lord? Okay. Now, he's not calling him God. Don't, you know, don't overstate it because he's not. But what he is saying is that the son of David, that David recognized that his future son would in some way be greater than himself. Okay. So it doesn't go all the way to divinity, but it does suggest that there's more going on with the son of David than just, you know, the progeny of David. There there will be a a son who is greater. Uh, Another one, Psalm 45, verse 7, says, Your throne, O God, stands forever. Your royal scepter is the scepter of justice. And it's talking about the Davidic king, the Messiah. Okay. And this is a really powerful text because it says that your throne, the Messiah, calls him God. Okay. So uh, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So the Messiah is called God. There's lots of other ones. Zechariah 13, 6 through 7. Zechariah 12, 10, Zechariah 14, 1 through 4. The list goes on and on and on. Um, so I, I don't know. If you take all this into consideration, in what sense could you say it's fiction? Because it certainly seems very plausible. All right, folks. Uh, hope you enjoyed the program. It's been a lot of fun going through it. Great emails. Keep them coming, folks. Like I said, coming up next week, we're going to have Stellar Week with Steve Ray. Father Robert Spitzer, Kylo Brassard, and Dr. Douglas Beaumont coming into the dojo. We're going to be rocking the dojo next week. Can't wait. Coming up next, the dynamic duo of Catholic Talk, High Intensity Catholic Talk with Terry and Jesse show. Time for me to shut down the Midwest Command Center and turn off the dojo lights. I hope everybody has an incredible weekend, and uh, God bless you all, and God willing, I'll see you Monday. See you later. Bye-bye. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were opened to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. 
I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church. So I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.